Hi everyone, it is time to slay some dragons as we search for our happily ever after and find our fairy tales. Tonight's guest is Malik Ponchali. He's an actor that you probably recognize from his roles in shows like Weeds and 30 Rock. He also voices some pretty awesome characters in various cartoons as well, like Sanjay and Craig and Phineas and Ferb. But while I certainly recognized him from those roles on television and his success as an author, I actually got the opportunity to meet him uh, when he wrote his debut middle grade book called The Best at It. He's actually from the Tampa Bay area. He grew up here and there's an awesome bookstore here called the Oxford Exchange. And they reached out to me because they know I like to write, I like to read, and I like to talk. And they gave me the opportunity to uh, host a conversation with Malik. And I got to read his book and talk to him about where the idea came from. And I think that not only does his life and his trajectory going to uh, such a huge stage as a successful actor fit into our discussion about how to find your fairy tale, it also uh, falls into the theme of his book for younger readers. The best at it is about a 12 year old gay Indian boy who's trying to find his place in the world and figure out what it is that he's the best at. And his, his grandfather tells him, you just have to find something that you're the best at and do it, do it with gusto and follow that, that dream. But the problem is you can't figure out what it is. And so if that isn't fitting with our theme of find your fairy tale, I don't know what is. So Molly Pancholi is joining us live. We're super excited to have him with us this evening to talk about how he figured out what he was the best at and how to go after his dreams and how you can apply some of that to your life. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I, I saw you in a past life in a pre-pandemic world when we could still do live events in person. It's kind of surreal, but I'm glad to see your face like this. I'm so happy to see you too. Thanks for having me on. I was just listening to all the nice things you were saying about the book. How sweet are you? I loved this book. <laughs> Remember, I'm, I'm such a mushy, emotional person. Anyone who knows me knows this. When I was talking about you know, some of the emotional realizations that he comes to. I literally was getting choked up telling you about it. I was like, I've had that scene. Uh -huh. the, the awesome thing about this book, guys, is it's very funny, but it's also very poignant in terms of, of coming of age and figuring out who you are. And was a lot of it, let's start with, with where you are today. When, yeah. when did you decide to look back and write a book when you're so busy with so many super successful shows? Oh my gosh, what, that's such a great question. Um, I love that we're just diving right into it. I, just, I do want to take a minute to say hi, because I know yeah. you touched on the fact that like we saw each other a lifetime ago, but it was mm -hmm. literally, it was actually November, so almost a year ago. Almost a year. And, um, and the time, it's crazy. been such a weird world. It almost seems like less time has passed because it's been this blur since, yeah. since March was, to now. I was going to say, it feels like it's only been six months or something like that, but it's literally been a whole okay. year and you were so kind to to do my book event with me in Tampa and it was such a big success and you're such a big part of that so like just that another thank fun. you and I've already thanked you yeah that was fun and there are a lot of people here locally who when I when I posted that you'd be joining us tonight they're excited uh, some of them oh, cool. said they went to high school with you others just know you yes. as a success from the community so it's kind of it's kind of cool you're, you're hanging out at home tonight yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um wait so to your question what made me yeah. write a book it's a, well, I mean, I, I feel like you and I talked about this a little bit. I feel like my camera is on such a weird angle that I'm going to You can change it however you want. We can, we can drive around. We can move it at an angle. It, uh... I know mine is kind of odd, too. I feel like it's sinking. <laughs> do you feel like you're sinking? I do feel like I'm, like, getting lower and lower. <laughs> I'm trying to do this whole, like, look above the top thing because it apparently makes you look better. But then I feel like I'm like this the whole, <laughs> like, the whole... I'm at the top interview. of the screen, so I find that I'm, I get so captivated by my guests and what they're saying. I look down at them, and then it ends up being me being like this the whole time. So. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, so, so the, real, the real reason that I wanted to write the book was that as an actor, and I think, I think you and I have talked about this just because of what you do and how visible you are being on screen in front of you know, millions of people all the time, but the fact that there's so little representation for people who look like us on, on TV. And it's something that I am so keenly aware of in terms of, of being an actor, but I hadn't really, I hadn't really like given it weight in terms of other mediums like books, even though when I was a kid, I loved reading books. And now as an adult, I look back and I'm like, my God, I never saw myself in any of the books that I read. So even though I loved them, I feel like there was like this double 
kind of narrative happening while I was reading them. There was, there was the idea that I related to these characters and I was, you know, fully invested in the story and, uh, and, and loving the book. And then another like side that was this subtle um, wiping away of who I was, because it was like, mm -hmm. you don't look like anyone whose stories you are relating to. So something must be wrong with you. Like you must need to be a little bit different if you're gonna, um, if you're going to, if your story matters, like if your story matters enough to be written in a book, then you must be more like the characters who are in books. And I think that's like a, a very, you know, adult and sophisticated way of thinking about it. I don't think I thought that as a kid, but I, I think it was back, happening. Kind of putting it into perspective now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I was having lunch with two friends randomly, and this is so interesting because it was on, uh, we were doing a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. So this was 2016. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and my two friends who um, hosted the fundraiser, we went to lunch and they happened to have a, um, a, a media company called In This Together Media. And they're, I, think, I don't think they're around anymore, but the, their mission was to increase uh, girls and people of color in books for young people. Yeah. And they were like, you know, you do all this work around representation in TV and film and theater. Um, have you thought about the book space? And I was like, well, I, there's no way I could write a book. Like that's so hard and you know, uh, and they were like, well, we think that you might have a story to tell here and, uh, and that your voice could be valuable. And so I left that meeting and I went home and I, I read a ton of middle grade books. I read a ton of young adult books. And the more I read, I was like, yeah, I do feel like I have a story to tell here. And, and I just, it reminded me of the profound impact that books had on me as a kid. And the idea that I could potentially tell a story and allow a young person to see themselves in a book in a way that they hadn't seen themselves, haven't seen themselves yet, uh, felt right. really important I mean, you me. even, it starts at the cover before you even get in the story. I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but when you can see somebody who looks like you on the cover, that's kind of that magnetic thing. Oh, what's this about, you know? Yeah, yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that was, that was like the beginning of the journey. And then, you know, I mean, you've, you, and, and, Correct me if I'm wrong, but this whole series got born out of the fact that you're writing your second book, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I'm co-authoring this particular project um, uh, with my, with my co-author, um, Dominique Richardson, and she, I think just, hi, I think she just tuned in right now. Um, oh. But yeah, it, it's inspired by fairy tales. And so we started digging in. And when I say inspired by fairy tales, I mean, this is like, this is deeply veiled, very modern, contemporary, crazy suspense but also fairy tales. So <laughs> the, the fun of it, though, was really starting to think about why people are drawn to this notion of happily ever after, and that mm -hmm. we all, you know, deserve that, and we strive for it, and that once we pick what that end destination is, sometimes it feels like failure if you deviate to something different, or you never quite get to that thing that you initially visualized. So yeah. I wanted to talk to people who've gone on really uh, incredible journeys in their own careers or life. And it doesn't have to be big. It can be small. It's just whatever their, their story strikes me as being one that was a little bit off the beaten track or uh, took them this way, that way, this way, you know, to get <laughs> yeah. to that end goal. And I think the yeah. fact that you, you know, you're, you're an actor, you're now an author, and you also have had the opportunity to work on a national scale uh, fighting bullying, an anti-bullying campaign. Tell me how that came yeah. to Yeah. So, I mean, you know, with, with kind of the visibility that comes from just being on television, a lot of things got handed to me. <laughs> in, 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 sorry, I don't mean like swag. I mean like, like meaningful <laughs> things. Like, you know, suddenly there were nonprofits and social policy organizations that were like, hey, will you come speak at a dinner? Will you mm -hmm. um, be the face of something? Will you, will you be involved in our work? And, and for me, so like, I'll, I'll try to keep this pretty brief, but because I had so little representation as a kid, yeah, I feel like I spent so much of my uh, young adult life running away from who I was and feeling like I needed to be somebody else to fit in, whether that was like be more white or be more straight or be more athletic, whatever it was, just like running away from all these things that, that were inherent to who I was. And then suddenly with like, with the visibility of being on television, uh, a lot of groups that approached me were like Asian American and Pacific Islander focused advocacy groups that were like, will mm -hmm. you come speak at our dinner? Or South Asian groups were like, will you, will you come, you know, ha be the headliner at our fundraiser or LGBTQ groups. And so I was given this platform that said, um, 
will you speak up for the very communities that, that I had spent a little bit of my life, you know, kind of running away from? And, and in that moment, I was like, you know, I can either really discover who I am yeah. and really stand up for what I believe in and really educate myself about the real issues that my communities are dealing with. Or I can choose to like live in a silo, cut myself off from the world, isolate. And so I chose, luckily, to, to be active. And by being active, I just got, uh, because of that involvement in 2014, I got appointed by President Obama, then President Obama, to serve on the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And so I served on this commission for three years and uh, the previous commission had started doing work around anti-bullying mm -hmm. for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth. And when I got there, I was like, this, this feels like the mantle I wanna, um, I wanna pick up. And I think a lot yeah. of it, you know, I didn't, I didn't experience um, like overt physical bullying, but I was certainly made fun of as a kid and made to feel different and called names. And uh, I knew intimately what it felt like to feel shame and feel ostracized. And, and so when I got to the White House, I was like, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to take up. And so we, when, as soon as I kind of like picked up that mantle, I went to the executive director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I was like, what can we do? How can we, how can we really impact young people? And she set up the first ever uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander anti-bullying task force at the White House. It was yeah. uh, people from five different departments. I think it was 25 different people. We did 29 listening sessions around the country. We met with parents and teachers and students. And out of that, we formed a campaign called Act to Change. Um, and so, you know, we were a White House campaign initially. And the idea was to like educate people, raise awareness, but also to get people to report bullying, uh, mm -hmm. like at the state and local level and certainly to the federal government. And then in, in 2017, when the administration changed over, we were kind of had this choice, like leave it a White House campaign or pivot it out. And, you know, we're, we're a national 501c3 now. We're a nonprofit. We're, we're yeah. partisan. So you're still I, heading it up, right? We're still, we're still yeah. doing it. But I, but I can say that the rhetoric from the White House made it really challenging to leave it a White House campaign because suddenly there was so much anti-Muslim rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and those were a large, uh, populate, large, large part of the populations that we were serving. And so uh, me and like, I think it was two other White House folks suddenly were like running this nonprofit on our own. Uh, now, three, three, four years later, we're, um, you know, we have an amazing working board of like 10 people. We have an advisory council of uh, luminaries that I feel very unworthy around. People like uh, Michelle Lee, the editor of Allure Magazine, and Tan France is on our advisory council, and wow, yeah. Hudson Yang from uh, Fresh Off the Boat, and um, and we're doing really, we're doing really great work. We actually have a youth conference coming up on October 24th. So if people follow um, the Act to Change social media, like Instagram account, you'll see, yeah. you'll, you'll see some, uh, some stuff about that. I feel like I'm so close to you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is, pro maybe it's the way, it, I think we're the same size because I know that okay. that can feel weird when, you know, you're talking to someone and one of you is like giant head and the other yeah. one is tiny friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, on on the the act to change note a little bit. I mean, you're you're in this this nonprofit sphere, but you also have the stage of of acting to make a difference. And even the idea that we have cartoon characters now that you can relate to. I know you were super excited about some of the opportunities that you've had lately. But before we get into that, I want to rewind a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To to Thirty Rock because so many people are so familiar with your character on Thirty Rock. Okay, that's a character that anybody can be. But if you were a kid actor, let's say, and you wanted to be, you know, the main the main son, the kid of of a couple on any given sitcom, um, it was probably not going to be an Indian couple <laughs> right, at that point right. in time. <laughs> so how have things changed from when you got started with your character in Thirty Rock to where you are now? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, in talking about the book, which I just saw you show everyone before, which was like so nice of you, um, there's a scene in the book where the 12-year-old uh, lead character decides that he wants to audition for a local bank commercial. That's and right. he goes to this bank to audition for the commercial. And they're like, you know what? Um, they're like, we have already cast the parents uh, that are going to be like the happy family in this bank commercial. And they're white. So uh, so we can't, we're not even going to let you audition. And 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 it's like a really, 
you know, I'm, I'm making fun of it now, but it's like a really tough moment for this mm -hmm. character. And that is, that is based uh, on so many experiences like the one that you just described, where it was like, hey, I would love to be on this sitcom. I'd love to audition for this movie. But the people who get to play the lead roles are all white. And in fact, like if there was a role that felt age appropriate and there were like older parents, they were like, yeah, we're never gonna, like how, why would white parents have an Indian Indian kid? And so you can audition for um, this role of the guy who has like two lines in the store because there's, there's, there's just isn't room for you uh, on the show. And so, you know, that, I think that's changed a lot, you know, but I don't, I don't, I think we also have a long, long way to go. And I think when we talk about diversity on television now there's a number of shows that we can point to but but when you start to really break it down it's like you can count them you know on a hand or two uh or we point to like the same people like yeah but there's mindy Kaling, or but there's aziz ansari and it's like yeah but um how like if, if we were like let's talk about white actors <laughs> we'd be like like unroll right. the, you know like, mm -hmm. the long list so i think that we have a, i think we have a long way to go and i think when you look at um percentages of population compared to uh, representation, there, there's definitely a disconnect there. And I think that to, to put yourself in a humorous sphere, sphere too is interesting because you have, when it comes to, you know, your, your fairy tale in a sense, to, to have more diversity, to, to have more opportunity for, for younger people following in your footsteps, um, you're doing it on a platform that involves a lot of humor. So it's a serious heartfelt mission but you get to be silly all day long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I like, know. I think comedy is, is um, and I love drama. I, yeah. I, it's funny because, like, I do so much comedy, but I, t I feel like most of the shows we watch tend to be, like, really dark. But um, I, think, I think there's something about comedy that it's, an, it's a great equalizer mm -hmm. and it, it allows for a lot of accessibility. And I also think that, you know, a lot of times, I think characters or the you know, characters that are based on people who have been somewhat marginalized. I think that a lot of us have had to use humor uh, to deal with certain situations. And so, yeah. you know, I'm not surprised uh, also that, that, that comedy becomes a space where these characters can actually kind of flourish and exist. That, that makes a lot of sense. Do you have any, uh, any funny stories from, from, I mean, you've worked with a lot of very well-known comedians from Tina Fey, <laughs> yeah. who ended up surprising you at your, your New York City book launch to yeah. Alec Baldwin. I mean, you, you've definitely overlapped with, with well-known comedians. So yeah. when you yeah. hit that point in your career and you started out, let's say, high school drama club, you know, did you right. think you were going to get there when you said, okay, this is where I'm going. This is the dream that I'm mm -hmm. building. When did you hit a moment where you said, I've made it or are you always still trying to make it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think there are like, there, there have been moments in my career where I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And I kind of have to pinch myself and be like, I can't believe I'm getting to do this. And, and one of those moments was certainly walking on set and seeing uh, Alec Baldwin kind of like hunched over a script and like Tina being like, oh, come here, come here. And I was like, oh my, oh my gosh, this is like, this is insane that this is, this is happening. But, uh, but I also think that part of being an artist is, is that we are always kind of hustling. Like you're always looking for mm -hmm. the next thing. You're always trying to grow. You're always hoping for like something to top, uh, you know, the, the last opportunity. Although I will say that, you know, when you, when you come off of a show like 30 Rock where the writing was so insanely good, uh, you, I, I have read many scripts since then. And I'm like, oh gosh, just a, what a gift <laughs> that, that we all got to, that we all got to make that show. Um, but to answer your question about, you know, the high school drama uh, nerd in me looking forward and being, um, you know, what is that career going to look like? I don't even know. I don't like fully know uh, like what that dream was. I know that it, it involved mm -hmm. watching the Tony Awards and thinking like, like, you know, maybe one day I'd make movies or, or, yeah. or go to Broadway. And this is so interesting, I think, in terms of what you were talking about, about the idea of finding, finding your fairy tale and that things shift and change and, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't think I was, I wasn't like, oh, I want to be on a sitcom. <laughs> like, right, I don't think that right. was like, I don't think that was like really it wasn't that fully specific. in the dream. Yeah. Or I don't think I was like, I want to be on a cartoon, you know, and, and, and not to say that people don't have those dreams, but I just don't, I think it was like, I'm going to be a movie star or, you know, like I'm going to yeah. go to New York and be on Broadway Umbrella. and I've yeah. done movies and I've, and I've, and I've been on Broadway, but I, but the bulk of my career has been um, comedic television. There's been a ton of animation stuff. I never uh, thought I was going to write a book. 
Um, mm -hmm. I loved writing a book, but so I think there is something about um, following sort of, I'm trying to think of a good fairy tale metaphor, the yellow brick road, <laughs> Fo <laughs> like fo following like the, not the path. Not technically a fairy tale, but I feel like <laughs> The Wizard of Oz falls in that sphere in our minds. I right. think that we, we store that story in the same place for sure. But yeah, follow <laughs> yeah. the yellow brick road. You just have to go, follow, 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 and off you go to, <laughs> yeah, to see yeah. what's there. Um, how do you get into character for a cartoon compared to on on camera, you know, actually you physically there? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, some of it's some of it's surprisingly the same in terms yeah. of, uh, um, you know, I, 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 this is like such like simple, like simplistic breakdown. But I, I definitely subscribe to the idea that characters are always in the pursuit of something and they're trying to move forward and they're trying to affect the other characters to get what they want. And so I think approaching a cartoon script isn't, you know, isn't so different from that. So, you know, when, when Baljeet and Phineas and Ferb needs everyone yeah. to pay attention to him because he's got the answer to how they're going to solve the, the mystery of how to get off this spaceship, I think that he really needs everyone to listen. And so you're kind of tapping into the same, like, what does this character need um, in this moment? And I see some people saying, hi, Baljeet, hi. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's, that's what made me think of it too. Yeah, and that, I, you know, to take just a moment, if, if you are watching right now and you have a question, um, I know, Malik, you'll probably, you know, be happy to answer questions that pop yeah. up. Is That's the whole awesome thing about this platform is we can have a conversation with, with anyone and everyone who chooses to, to join us and, and tune in. But yeah, yeah. Your voice is, uh, I mean, it's a little, there are similarities. I could pick you out from the cartoon, <laughs> but yeah. it's obviously a little bit, you know, amped up and different. How do you, how do oh, you do, right. figure out what your voices are? And do you sit around like, practicing them figuring them out and then you know when you when you auditioned or gave your your sample for it or they approached you and said how do you approach how do you uh come up with this character yeah take us through that process a little bit because i think it's just it's such a fun a fun behind the the curtains kind of thing totally well so so uh um both phineas and ferb and then and sanjay and craig which were which were cartoons that i did that ran for a long time and i had like yeah. really substantial roles on them they uh both of them, I got to go into a, a sound booth and have the producers give me feedback right away. Okay. It, was, it was like auditioning four people uh, with Phineas and Ferb. I, you know, all I knew was that this character was like very young, and so I, I, um, you know, I was kind of like, okay, I'm gonna sound like a kid, you know, and and then they were like, oh, actually, can you make your voice a little bit higher? And I was, and you know, by the time I left, it was like, hi, I'm Bajit, you know. And we got to this like super, <laughs> super high voice, which I kind of kicked myself for in those first few episodes because. Um, a lot of the times the way we recorded that cartoon, they would, you'd have four scripts, you know, four different episodes or whatever it was. And it was just you, you know, I, I wasn't in the room with the other actors. And so literally like three, four hour records of being like, Tiny up here, Tiny up here. And then at the end of the session, they'd be like, so Malik, I'm like, I can't talk anymore. Like, I, I gotta go. I have no voice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, and then, and Sanjay and Craig was kind of the same thing. I was, I was in LA, the producers were in LA, I went in. Um, they kind of worked with me. And, and I think that's often, um, that's often the case. I actually just started recording on a new series that I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to talk about because we're, it's, it's happening and it's on Netflix, but I don't know if they've publicized it yet. And but I did an audition. Quiet, but there, so you, quiet. there's a thing. There's but a I thing just, that's um, happening. Yeah, like I, so I sent in. So during COVID, uh, I outfitted a closet in my home uh, into a, I turned it into a, a home sound booth, which took a lot of, uh, a lot of trial and error with like placing sound foam and getting right, the right mic, but but I have it now. And so for this cartoon, I literally sent in an audition. Yeah. They came back with like, we loved your audition. We'd love for you to do the part. Uh, we were, the record is happening over like an, uh, a, a, an internet ISDN line and then they're on Zoom. And so I'm in like my little closet and they're out, the creators <laughs> are on Zoom and they're like, so we loved what you did in the audition, but we'd like, um, we want to try making this character a little more this, a little more that. And so we kind of find the voice. And, and a big part of that is, you know, well, let's just do three or four lines from the script a few times until we feel like we know where it is. And then that'll be our reference point uh, for the character going forward. So that's, that's kind so of like, cool. yeah. Yeah, yeah your, your yeah. sound booth sounds a lot better than mine for tracking the news because mine is also in my closet, but my soundproofing is just my clothes. And I go <laughs> yeah. as close as I can to like the fuzziest bathrobe or sweater there to kind of get rid of that echo. And that's yeah. my super high tech um, sound. Have you, <laughs> have you been broadcasting from home? Yeah, we broadcast from home um, primarily, you know, for the first month or even two, even anchoring. Um, but now wow. we've kind of sliced up the building into 
different smaller studios in our sales department downstairs in the back studio. So we have limited overlap with colleagues. So I'm still all by myself wow. in what wow. used to be a sales office and I don't see anybody. And then oh I do God. all my consumer reporting from uh, right here, but <laughs> right over there with a big screen. See, ready? It's, it's black right now. Hold on. That is, that's my- Oh, wow. We, we turn it on and it becomes the newsroom. So wow. we go from the writing world to the news world right over there. And what this are- been um, such a crazy, like disrupting force in this, in, in so many industries that we can yeah. do so much from home. It's gonna be crazy to see what lasts, what sticks around. Yeah. What are, what are you, do you use your iPhone? <laughs> yeah. To broadcast the news? Yeah. That's amazing. When I was anchoring from, from home, we did have a big camera and a little, um, you know, live box that, that was a lot more reliable because that was a four hour show. But when wow. I'm doing my little segments, it's uh, an awesome little app. There's an app yeah. for that. There's That's an app for amazing. that. That's it amazing. It is. I can't imagine what it would have been like, you know, if this happened 10 years ago when we still needed the microwave trucks and the satellite trucks and, God. you know, the big, that we, we would be, I don't know. I don't think we would be able to hide quite as well. Yeah. So, I mean, we you did. were, you were right in the heart of it for the most part, right? In New York. Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky. We have a house outside the city, so I, yeah. I kind of escaped in um, in March and have been out here for six months, which is nuts. I've been back a few times. Um, the city, I think, I think the city is like in a much different place now than it was in March mm -hmm. and April. But it was it was pretty like harrowing, you know. I think in terms of um, in terms of how that went, and you're you you, I'm like worried for you. <laughs> I'm worried. For, I'm worried for what's going to happen in Florida. A lot of people, I think, I think feel that way. I, what is it like for, I know that you've, you've been in shows on Broadway. What is yeah. it like for your friends and your colleagues whose shows have been, you know, permanently sidelined? And it's one thing to stop shooting, but to, to stop having your livelihood of being on stage. What's, what's that like for everyone? Yeah. So I was actually, uh, right after I saw you on book tour, uh, I went into rehearsals for a Broadway show and we were on Broadway from January to March and we closed on March 1st scheduled. We, yeah. um, we, we was a limited run. Uh, and I think we were the last Broadway show to close on schedule. And then literally the next week, they just started shutting show after show right. Right. down. Um, I think it's really challenging. And you know, such a, such, I was reading an article in something, I think the New York times, but I'm not sure, but about, um, how different cities have been impacted in different ways. And New York City has been impacted in a really rough way because we're a huge uh, service oriented city. Right. You know, like we're, we're, we have theater and concert halls and restaurants and all these things that it's just still can't entertainment. come back. It, it's yeah. food and entertainment. And even, even the way that everything is so condensed. I mean, you go to a restaurant, you're right next to the table yeah. beside you, very different. Distancing isn't really an option. It's not. And so I think Broadway, it's really sad. You know, I knew people that were gonna make their Broadway debut yeah. or shows that never got to open or were in previews or shows that were gonna come that might not ever come now. Um, I think I saw someone on here, uh, someone's name fly up who I think was in a show that had to close early. And so I think, you know, it's, it's certainly as an artist, it's really sad. I'm, I feel very lucky that my career is somewhat diversified and that I can, um, I'm actually writing a second book that I'm working on right now and I'm, uh, have a home voiceover studio and right. um, you were able and, to sort of shift into yeah. being sustainable from but a distance and from your home. But it's really tough. And I think, I think some TV stuff is going back and there's been, you know, a couple uh, like experimental theatrical productions with people in masks or audience behind like a, a plexiglass yeah. wall. And, but, but it's just not, I don't know when it's going to come back in the way that, that it'll, it'll feel like it's thriving, you know? So yeah, you know, I think you mentioned people who are supposed to debut and you just think about how to funnel disappointment when it's out of your control. Were there ever any moments in, in your career track where you just really felt like something had gotten ripped away or ripped out from under you? And how did you, you know, I, I say that that's slaying your dragons, but whether it was your own, your own doubt or something externally that happened, how did you talk yourself back from that? Yeah, um, being an actor, I feel like, you get slayed quite a bit. <laughs> there is like, um, there's certainly it's been- It's part of the process. You have to be like, okay, I was stabbed in the heart today. I'll come back yeah. to tomorrow. How, totally. how will you get me tomorrow? Poison potion, cool. Yeah, 
And it's everything from I really wanted that audition and I never mm -hmm. heard back to uh, they're cutting my character out of something or you go to a movie and you're like, wait a minute, but I had a whole nother scene and it's not even in there anymore. You know, all those kinds of disappointments. I think that um, I think coming back from it actually like requires a lot. Like I think I think being an artist, uh, one of the challenges is like you're not the product that you're selling is you. And so mm -hmm. when it gets rejected, it feels really, really, really personal. And personal, also like, yeah. you know, like you're making choices. So like when you audition for something and you're like, you, you think you did a great job and then you don't ever hear anything, you're like, wait. And of course, as an adult, and as the, the more you get into the business, uh, I've come to realize that of course, it's so dependent on so many other things, you know, how you look and what the re makeup of the rest of the cast is and whether or not the producer just wanted to hire a friend, you know, all these things. But I think coming back from it in a large part requires um, a letting yourself grieve like you yeah. have to like be okay with being let down sometimes and be and be sad also having a community of people around you who remind you to look at who you are and remind you that that this one moment is not uh definitive of of the rest of your life um and then I think also like I've come to wear some of those things as um you know badges of honor it's like hey guess what I got written off a show, you know, like <laughs> I, I'm in the club because because uh, you start to read about like so many people, you know, so many people that I've looked up to who who that happens all the time. This is just par for the course. It's just par par for uh, the career that that we've chosen, I guess. I mean, you yeah, must have like, dealt with a lot of stuff like that or not a lot, sure, maybe sure. not. But yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, between between publishing a book and, and TV is so subjective, whether you're um, a news anchor, a reporter, or an actor. It's, it's completely what, how they need to balance out their newsroom or their cast. Do they need somebody like you? Did something that you did not quite jive with, with what they were expecting for the role? You know, they might've already right. had a preconceived notion in their head of, of what they wanted. And it could be as simple as, well, they don't, they don't like your look because that's just not, it has, it's so crazy subjective. So yeah. I think it's, it's very similar in in that sense where you just don't know but i like that you say it's okay to grieve because i think there's this idea that you're supposed to be so tough and when you get pushed back or you don't get that thing that you want you're not allowed to be sad and it can even infect your outlook where you don't even let yourself want it because you want to protect yourself from that disappointment and then if you don't let yourself want it you stop being honest and i i swear the universe knows and then it stops giving you things yeah yeah well, and I, I mean, I think part of what you're, what you might be touching on here is something that I was kind of talking about earlier with this idea that I think a lot of people who are marginalized um, use comedy to deal with it because in mm. a way it's like, if I make fun of myself first, then you can't make you fun can't of do me. It. Yeah. 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 And so, and I think that that, like building up that, um, that armor, like it, it might work in the short term to say like, I didn't want that anyway, or who cares? Or uh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't fire me, I walked away or whatever it is, whatever that story is that you have to tell yourself. But ultimately, um, I think to be an artist, you have to be able to access your vulnerability. So in a way, those awkward, those moments where it's like, wow, this is really tough. There's also something in there about um, touching base with your own humanity that, uh, that will allow you to grow into the next experience that you have. And I think if you just have this armor around you all the time, you're never gonna, you know, you're never gonna get to move past it either. And I, and I like what you said. I like what you said about um, the universe kind of knows. <laughs> like I do, I kind of subscribe to that too. Like this idea that like what you, what you put out is, is what you're going to get back. And if you're like pretending you don't care all the time, then the universe might be like, well, if you don't care. You right. Know? I mean, I, I found that one of the, the, the dragons that I had to slay was that I had to stop making myself smaller before I even got there. You know, oh, they're not going to hire me because I'm not good enough. Why would they publish my book? You know, you, it, there's a fine line between being humble and mm -hmm. selling yourself short. And there's a fine line between being okay with not getting the big opportunity and actually depriving yourself of it because you don't have the confidence. Yeah. And I think that that, that's something that talking to my guests, I love to dig into because there are so many moments where your confidence could have failed you, but you were able to, you know, grab it and, and keep going and, and keep pushing. So for somebody who is thinking like, wow, I can't do that, or I tried to do that and it didn't work. What's some advice that you have to go at it again or go at it in a different way? 
Yeah, um, that's that's a really good question. I don't I don't I don't know why I just thought of this, but I um, so we've been working on uh, adapting uh, the best at it. Uh, for for television and so interesting yeah. like now that I'm in that I haven't done that before I've, I've I think I pitched one uh, I pitched one other TV show idea to like one studio like it's it's this so this is feels like a relatively uh, new space to me and knowing um, what my bait like like how attached I am to this and how like how I want it to go right and how I want the right people associated with it. And I want it to move forward in the right way. Like having that feeling I took into an experience that I had on um, just on Friday of, of last week, I recorded yeah. on a new, uh, a new, a pilot uh, for Netflix. And I was, and I was thinking about how like so often when I go in for like, it's like new people and it was, it was an animated pilot for Netflix, like all the, like new people and all the, you know, it's like, Oh gosh, am I going to be what they want and all that stuff and all that anxiety. And I think for the first time, I really understood that this is somebody's baby, like mm -hmm. someone who got this pilot, like greenlit and wrote it and drew out the storyboards, like they're on that call and they're probably equally as anxious and, and they're not here to judge me. They're like, they cast me. Like they were like, they're so we want you to be the, yeah, 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 exactly. And this idea that it really made me think of, of like going into a meeting like that is more of a collaborative thing versus a like, am I going to be good enough? And I don't know, I, I don't think that was exactly your question, but that came to me when you were asking that question, that this idea of like, how do you approach every one of those moments? And I think one of the things that's so hard, and I, and I heard you talk about this, is that I think that we, that the letdown when things don't go our way uh, feels particularly tough because part of what we have to do is to go into each one of those situations believing uh, it's ours, like believing right. we're going to be brilliant, believing because otherwise, like why go, <laughs> you know, like why, why show up? And so then when it, if it goes badly, which things sometimes go badly, or if you're just not right or mm -hmm. whatever it is, it feels doubly hard because you've, you've built yourself up um, right. in all the ways you should have. So, right. So it's almost like this catch 22 that we've talked ourselves into here tonight where <laughs> you have to, you have to be brave enough to hurt if you fail or fall because you have to believe in yourself that much higher to get there in the first place, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. yeah, you might not hurt when you, if you do fail, but it's because you didn't try. You didn't give it your right. all. You didn't believe exactly. in yourself. And if you don't walk in there being like, yes, I, I deserve this, why are they going to think that you deserve yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like those, it's like people who show up unprepared because then if it doesn't happen, it's not going to happen. It's like, well, what might have happened if you had prepared and were willing to deal with rejection anyway, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because so many people would take pieces of other people's careers and say, that would be enough for me, you know? And then once you're where you are, you in general, you personally, it's so easy to then go after the next bigger thing, the next bigger thing. And uh, what I love about your your efforts is that it's not just about, hey, I want to be an actor. You know, you said when you were back in, in high school and drama club, you said, I want to be a movie star. But now look, you want to be a movie star who, and movie star I used because you used it, but an actor um, who creates a more diverse entertainment world. Would you say that that is a bigger life goal for you now in terms of, of the long-term happily ever after? Or is that just sort of, an overarching um, kind of core effort every day? Uh, I think a little bit of both, honestly. Like I think, um, I think I'm like very, very uh, driven by, by making real change happen, by this idea that, that there are people whose stories need to be uplifted and, and, it, and it doesn't feel, um, this is gonna sound like back, back padding, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel selfish to me in that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not just doing it so that I get cast in something. I'm doing it because I, uh, because I truly believe, especially with young people, that they deserve to see themselves on television and in movies and in, and in books, and that it can have a profound, <clears throat> excuse me, that it can have a profound impact to see yourself in a story. You know, I'm, I'm sure you know this having written for young people as well, but, but the whole concept of um, mirrors, and, um, uh, mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors and that a piece of art for a young person can be a mirror into their own experience and it can be a, um, a window into someone else's experience. And, mm -hmm. and I think at its best, it's a sliding glass door where, where, where people are moving in and out of each other's experiences. And I, I truly believe that. And I think when I look at 
where we are as, as a world today, where we are as a country today and how divisive we are, this idea that if we could all live in each other's spaces a little bit more, uh, that we might not be so divided. And I, and, I, and I really believe that art affords us the opportunity to do that in ways that we might not be able to do that in the physical world, you know, so that there, you know, for many people in the place they live, seeing a TV show with uh, a person of color from a specific culture on it, it might be the first time they're getting introduced to that culture. And so that's so important in terms of what that story can be. So, so that has become like a big part of what I wanna do as an artist. And then the other piece of it uh, is that I think that like, like I spent a little bit of time running away from who I was as, as a mm -hmm. young person, I also think, I also thought acting was about that. That I, I thought acting was about um, disappearing into another character. And, I, and, and as I grew to be, I think, a better actor and a better artist and I studied more, I really realized that it's about like letting as much of yourself like seep into the character as you can, like bringing all of your experience. And of course, like you're transforming into a character as an actor, but, but the idea that like my specific point of view, my yeah. specific You're bringing your, so your time on this planet, your perspective, your your humor, your voice into it, your voice really. Is yeah. yeah, and so, that, so that's like a big part of what I, I, what I wanna do. And the fact that like, I am who I am automatically would bring that diversity <laughs> to a role <laughs> anyway, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So yeah. You know, it's, it's such a noble push that so many artists are doing to create a more diverse selection. But there are so many artists who have always been creating. So is it a problem? Do you think we need to keep pushing at the gatekeepers? There's plenty of artists and plenty of, of diverse voices out there. So do you, do you talk about, you know, what went wrong in the sense of how did we get to a limited place? And then how do we fix it? How do we give more opportunity without taking opportunity from, from others who want to tell a story too? Yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right to, to, to say gatekeepers, because I think, um, you know, like following all the protests, we've heard from so many corporate entities, and I'm talking about mostly like studios and networks who yeah. made this real commitment to diversity. Uh, I have sat in some rooms recently uh, with, at networks and studios, and although I do think that they want to do the right thing and that they're very committed to doing the right thing, um, it has been a, a largely, a, a large sea of white faces. And so not having voices in the room that can actually speak, uh, speak to the real needs of other communities, I think is really tough. So I think you can talk a good diversity game, but, they, but you really have to um, promote people to the places where they can actually make decisions and make impacts. And, you know, I just think about it in terms of like, I take this, this I, I brought my book, but you, you already have it. So I was like, <laughs> this book, I'm like touching a, okay. an empty, but I take that in and I'm like, you know, I can, get, I can give you a great pitch. I can yeah. tell you all the things I want to tell you um, and you will hear it and you will probably give me a lot of respect for it and understand that that's my experience. But you might not even know the questions to ask me about my experience because you, you're not familiar with it. And, and maybe if you were Indian American and you were in that room, you'd say, well, what about this part of it? Like, how will the family move through this part of it? And so those mm -hmm. questions can't even be asked. So even if you have people who are like, really willing to um, to hear it and talk about it and want to promote it. Uh, I just think about like, what's that little margin of difference that could happen if you had someone who had uh, a marginalized experience in the room as well. So that's the way, you know, looking, looking forward to the, to the far future, hopefully the newer future, you see it as being, um, we need changes in, in the decision-making level. I think so. And I think, I think um, part of it, is giving people opportunities because I think there's a lot of really qualified people who are already ready to step into that into those yeah. roles. And then I think another part of that is building a pipeline for for more people to be in those roles. And I think about you know being Indian American and, and I'm so curious about your experience with this, but I don't you know I don't I don't know if your parents were like you should be a news anchor <laughs> or you know. And I think my parents were like extremely supportive when I decided that I wanted to be an actor. Um, but I also think that they are, uh, they're an anomaly in that way. And I, I mean, I still meet in 2020, uh, so many uh, Asian American or Indian American kids who are like, oh yeah, I kind of want to do the arts, but I know I could never make a career in that. So I'll just do it on the side. And I'm like, well, why can't you make a career in that? Like, what is that voice in your head telling you you can? And so I, I feel like we have to encourage young people to be like, you mm -hmm. know what, you could be, you could run NBC. You could be the head of 
this. You could be making decisions. You could write a script. You could, we have, to, and, and I think that's through every a traditional career path, certainly in politics, the Senate and Congress do not look like what America looks like. And there's a reason for that because people, uh, well, there's many reasons for that, but, it, but, but one thing is, I don't know if enough, enough young people are running for state and local government and, and building the pipeline to be the president, you know, so. There are so many careers and so many jobs where society tells you you're going to fail or you're going to get lost. Only this like, you know, magical tiny group succeeds in, in, and, and a lot of it has to do with these, you know, celebrity careers, whether it's as an athlete or as an actor or as a politician, you're not going to make it to the top. And so I think then by mistake, we discourage people to go into that track at all. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I, I love what you're I love what you're saying, what you're pointing out is we have to yeah. stop telling our young people that that certain tracks are, are tough or impossible and just see what it is that they love. Yeah. in their hearts to do and say, okay, how do we make this be sustainable? How do we help this put food on the table and money in the bank? Yeah. And I, and by the way, like, I remember getting that a little bit on both sides as a, as a kid when I, when I was like announcing that I wanted to, to be an actor, you know, yeah. uh, I remember like, you know, some uncles and aunties being like, you don't look like anyone on TV in America. And then going to India and people like, you don't look like a Bollywood star. And I was like, <laughs> you know what, I'm going to be who I'm going to be. You know be I mean? you. Yeah. But that but I think that's exactly right. It's like we it's hard for us to imagine the things that we can't see, which, you know, to take us all the way back to where we started this conversation is why the is why representation is so important. Uh, you know, in the first place, I think about, I have a four year old niece who lives in, in New York City. And, uh, and her mom is uh, my cousin is is, 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 is she's like, look at Kamala Harris, you could be the vice president someday. But we didn't have that person to point to before, you know, and so representation like that really, really makes an impact. Yeah, it helps to, to be able to literally lead by example and, and have, you know, things to show to show children. Um, were you ever terrified of your own career? Were, when when, when you, were you most scared? Um, uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when have I been most scared of my career? I mean, I think the thing about uh, an acting career, because I have so many friends who are not, uh, who are not actors, is, um, is that you're always a freelancer. Mm. And, and being a freelancer. You don't know when the next thing is coming. Yeah, you don't know when it is. And, and, you know, I've been very lucky to do many long running things. You know, 30 Rock ran for seven years and Phineas and Ferb. We just did a Phineas and Ferb movie in 2020. And we started recording that cartoon in 2006. So, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of like um, things that have lasted, uh, but they don't last forever. And there's no, there's no trajectory. There's no, you know, if you're if you're an associate for three years, you become a manager and then you become a director and then you become a partner or whatever, whatever. I don't know if that's even the right path, but, but that doesn't exist. Uh, and so I think that there's like this, just the constant sort of, um, the constant Un terror, <laughs> the constant terror. <laughs> the constant terror, what's yeah. going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> you're scared every minute of every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What about one of the funniest things that ever happened to you? What's a favorite story that you tell in terms of either getting into the biz or any, any funny overlaps you had or flubs or blubs or anything that, that you're just like, oh my gosh, you won't believe this. Oh my gosh. I, that's such a good question. And you, you think that I like, after all these years, I would have like a good, uh, a good answer for that. I when I asked you, I was even thinking, I'm like, do I have a go-to in news? And I don't know that I do. Sometimes there's these questions. It's like, You'll think of it tomorrow and you'll be like, oh, that time. Yeah, and that time. Yeah. They just become the fabric of, of our daily lives and you laugh about it, you know, one week and you forget about it the next. Totally, totally, totally. <laughs> it's all a blur. I don't know if I, I don't, yeah, I can't think of anything uh, off the top of my head, but, but it's, you know, there's, it's been a lot of fun. Like I've, like you said, I've gotten to work with so many people. I think one of the, um, like one of the things I point to in my career is just like how many amazing people I got to act alongside. I mean, when you were, when you were talking about comedy, it's like working with like Lisa Kudrow on the comeback or uh, on her show web therapy. And uh, I just saw Dan, Dan O'Brien is I think on, on, on our thing, we did a TV series called Whitney together, but just like being around like so many really talented people. It, it's just, it's, it's always fun. And it's always very interesting. Yeah. You can learn so much and you just, you're surrounded by people who you're going to pick up little things from that you probably don't even realize until you stop working with them, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also it's so different. Like I remember 
Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin are like super different actors, you know, <laughs> like they're, they're, they, they work really differently. And so you learn different things from them on set. Uh, you know, like Lisa Kudrow, even I, I remember thinking she's an innovator. Like she went from being one of the most celebrated sitcom actresses to creating multiple shows that were super groundbreaking at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's really inspiring. You know, it's, it, she, when I shot web therapy, I did four episodes of that show. I don't know if anyone even knows it. It was on Showtime uh, with Lisa Kudrow, but I went out to like some warehouse in Van Nuys. <laughs> we literally shot four episodes in a, in a day. There were, and Meryl Streep was coming in the next day and they had like zero budget. They were literally making a web series. Um, that ended up being a show on Showtime. Yeah. And at the time, yeah. no one was doing web series. It was like, what is this? What is this weird thing that Lisa Kudrow is trying to do out of this, like, crappy soundstage in, 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 whatever. <laughs> in a warehouse? <laughs> and where, where am I? Yeah. 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 But see, yeah. that's that's just uh, when somebody has an idea, you just have to go for it completely. Yeah. Yeah. We really talk about finding your fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it might be on a crappy soundstage in a weird warehouse. You never know. <laughs> you never know. If you were to finish the sentence um, to find your fairy tale with some yeah. advice, you know, to find your fairy tale, you need to. To find your fairy tale, you should. Do you have Do you have something that you would you would fill in there? Yeah. Um, I'm probably thinking about this too much, but uh, I mean, my, the first thing that came into my brain was like to you have to dig deep. Um, and I think that, that there's a process of like really, really listening to, to what, to like who you are, listening to who you are and where you're happy and, and, and following that, you know? I mean, I, I think about when we talked about this conversation I had around books for young people and just that little spark that was like, uh, yeah, maybe there is something in here. And like, and, but then I dug deep, then I went home and I read a bunch of books and I, and I took a lot of time. And then I was like, you know what? I, I think I've got my little, um, my satchel and my sword and I'm ready to head out on the road and see, see what dragons await me, <laughs> you know? But, but I think that, I think the beginning of it, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of a digging deep process that, that has to happen. And I certainly felt that um, with an acting career, you know, I, and, I mean, I've been kind of joking about it, but certainly a lot of people along the way were like, there's no way you could do that. There, there's no parts for you. And, um, but when I dug deep, I was like, no, I've, I've got to do this. And, and so I did it, you know? Um, so yeah, I would say, I, I guess that's maybe what I would say is to start, to start living your fairy tale. You gotta, you gotta dig deep. <laughs> And then grab your satchel and your sword. And then grab your satchel and your sword. <laughs> and then off you go. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Holly, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on Find Your Fairy Tale. It's always so great to see you. You have such a, a great, positive, energetic vibe about you that I, I really love to just experience. And I can't wait to see what you're up to next. I know you can tell, but it, <laughs> yeah. it'll pop up. And then I'll be applauding from uh, your your childhood home of, of Tampa. Uh, thank you. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for having me on. And I've, I've been watching some of these and, and it's just incredible that you're doing it and that you're having such, um, you know, such meaningful conversations that seem to be really inspiring people. So thank you for doing this. And, and also I'm like, cannot wait to, yeah. to, to see what this, I, I mean, I kind of got a sense of like an adult fairy tale uh, book that you're working on, but I can't wait to see it when it comes out. And I hope that your family is well and that you stay Everybody's safe. Everybody's as good as we can be in this in this strange, strange reality, you know? And, and in a weird way, the silver lining is that people are getting used to talking to each other like this and maybe this opportunity to to spend time with such inspiring people and pick their brains wouldn't have even been possible without yeah. uh, the weirdness of, of this world. But um, I'm so grateful for it because I don't know when I would have been able to convince somebody to spend an hour where I just get to be like, so let me <laughs> ask you all of the things I've always wanted to know. So I, I'm beyond grateful. And the fact that I can share it with other people is, is a great, a great thing. So for people who, who hate social media and, and say that it doesn't connect, you just have to find the right, the right community. A hundred percent. Well, I hope that you do many, 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 many more of these and like I watch a, a ton more and then I'll hopefully come back on. We'll get you back on with the next big yeah. exciting thing that you do. Perfect. Or just to hang out. Or just to hang. <laughs> it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Good night, everybody. Thanks Bye, so much everyone. for tuning in. Thanks for coming. Yep. Go slay the dragons. <laughs>